uh, I asked you the question, why do we need an international, international monetary system? Why do we need to trade currencies at all? And the answer is that you typically get is sort of the three bullet points that I've got up there. Uh, some people, when I say, well, why do we want to exchange currencies? Well, they say, well, it's a good way to make money. And that's true. Currency traders do make a lot of money. Uh, if you take a class in international finance, uh, I'll have one this summer probably. Uh, you know, we'll talk about how you can trade currencies for fun and profit. Uh, but that's not primarily what we want to talk about when we talk about why we have an international monetary system. An international monetary system at its core does not exist to benefit people who trade currencies. What happens in the international monetary system is that we have a system engaged with, that permits people to uh, uh, engage in the purchase of goods and services across national boundaries. So basically to support the import and export of goods and services. And number two, to help uh, uh, create a system in which it's possible for uh, capital to flow across national boundaries. So the international monetary system makes it possible for people in Germany to invest in, in the United States and people in China to invest in Australia, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so that's, that's the intent, that's the purpose of the system. <coughs> now, so we talked about that two weeks ago. The other point that we talked about two weeks ago is that broadly speaking, uh, exchange rate systems fall on a continuum. A continuum which at one extreme, uh, at one extreme uh, currencies are allowed to freely float and that means the currencies are set effectively by the forces of demand and supply, currency exchange rates are set by the forces of demand and supply. And when we sort of dug into the guts of that uh, a couple of weeks ago, what we said is that in a world in which we had freely floating exchange rates, uh, two critical macroeconomic variables are going to, that influence the exchange rate are going to be uh, the level of inflation, and the expected level of inflation and the level of interest rates. So interest rates and inflation rates are critically linked to uh, exchange rates under a floating rate system. And again, two weeks ago, we talked about the mechanics here and the, the way the forces work. Um, when you go to the other extreme, a fixed exchange rate system, this, again, to define it formally, is simply a system in which the government uh, and by the government, I mean both some combination of the treasury and the central bank of the country in question. Uh, the government actually just sets what the exchange rate is going to be and dictate what that number is going to be. Now, we talked again two weeks ago about how that might be accomplished. How can you fix an exchange rate if you're a country? And there's really only two options here. You can try and use the police force to set exchange rates. So you pass laws saying this has got to be the only uh, acceptable rate of exchange between our country's currency and some other country's currency. Or you basically rig the market uh, in order to maintain fixed exchange rates. Now, the first method, using the police to enforce a fixed exchange rate, uh, it almost never works. Uh, we see over and over and over in history countries that have attempted to do this. Uh, I think I probably told you the story about the former Soviet Union. Uh, more modern examples would be Argentina until a year ago and sad, pathetic Venezuela today. Uh, it's almost impossible for a country to uh, fixed exchange rates at the point of a gun because black markets crop up and people circumvent the, uh, uh, the official government exchange rate. The effective way that a country can uh, manage to set exchange rate though is, and I say rigging the market and that makes it sound sinister and pejorative, I don't mean it to be, uh, a country can fix exchange rate just if it stands ready to buy and sell currencies at the uh, uh, official uh, mandated rate of exchange, okay? 
So if your central bank announces we will buy currency, let's use China as the example because I'm about to talk about China. Uh, if, if China announces we will stand ready to buy currency at a rate of call it six RMB to the dollar, and we also stand ready to sell currency at a rate of six RMB to the dollar, uh, then that's what the exchange rate's gonna be. They've defined both the minimum and the maximum price for that currency, and, and that's the end of the discussion. Now, in order to be able to accomplish that, what a country has to do is have significant currency reserves, and, or I should say carefully, foreign currency reserves in order to be able to buy and sell. So ask, how could China fix the dollar to RMB exchange rate? Well, they have to be willing to sell RMB for dollars, but that's easy because China controls the printing press. They could always find a supply of RMB to sell in exchange for dollars. The hard part is the other side of that uh, market where they would have to be willing to buy uh, RMB for dollars. In order to accomplish that, the country has to have reserves of dollars in order to uh, uh, purchase the currency. Now, little current events, uh, you can see the problem. Um, or but the problem and the opportunity. Right now, China has significant reserves of US dollars that it's holding. So, uh, you know, depending on where you ask, or when you ask, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in reserves. This gives China uh, a real uh, arsenal, if you will, uh, to, uh, to support its currency if it wants to. It can use those dollar reserves uh, to offer to buy RMB, right? Uh, look at a country uh, which is unable to do that anymore, and that, of course, the, the, the sad, small poster child example of this is, uh, is Venezuela. Venezuela would like very much to support its currency. It would like to keep uh, uh, the dollar exchange rate relatively constant. And in the past, it used to be able to do this, and the reason it used to be able to do this is because Venezuela had big oil reserves that they sold for dollars. The government effectively controlled the oil sales, so the government had dollar reserves earned from its sale of, of oil, uh, and they could use this to support the currency. That's no longer true. Uh, our, our Venezuela's oil reserves are, are the, the, the oil production infrastructure is deteriorating, so they can't literally produce as much oil as they used to. And of course, dollar or the dollar price of oil is much lower than it was uh, uh, five or six years ago. So, are you suggesting that to be able to fix your currency, it has to be fixed to, compared to any other? That's by definition what I mean by fixed currency. Right. When we talk about a fixed currency in the modern world, that almost always means in relation to the U.S. dollar. So, so there you go. Now, I'm going to wander just for a minute. Uh, when I come back to this lecture, uh, but there's a kind of a so current events uh, stuff. I think you should know. Let me find my slides here real quick. Um, here we go. Um, so, and I'm. Um, you know, uh, I, please understand I'm not trying to get overtly political with you this morning. Um, but as you probably have heard, uh, uh, during the campaign, Donald Trump was very, uh, I guess the, the, the only way I can put it, is suspicious of China and China's trade relations with the U.S. Uh, that Trump apparently believes that uh, China or imports of Chinese goods into the U.S. is destroying the manufacturing sector and uh, that we need to do something to get China under control, I guess. Uh, so that's a big argument. I have lots of opinions. Buy me drinks and I'll share with you my opinions on that bigger <laughs> argument. Uh, but Donald Trump also made a, a kind of a smaller point on this theme, 
And that is, he made the point that China is manipulating, or made the claim that China is manipulating its currency. And they're manipulating their currency, and apparently, he believes, they're manipulating their currency in a way as to advantage their imports into U.S. markets. Uh, one of his main advisors is this guy named Peter Navarro, who's a professor at UB Irvine, or UC Irvine, uh, who kind of makes this argument all along the road. Um, I, I will tell you again, I'm not trying to lean, make this overtly political. Uh, Professor Navarro's views on these matters are decidedly out of the mainstream. Uh, the idea that China's advantage in U.S. import markets is a consequence of their manipulation of the currency in their favor, um, well, there's a lot of reasons to think, not just that that's wrong, but it's 180 degrees opposite. So let me talk specifically, uh, just for a minute or two, about what's happening with the RMB uh, exchange rate uh, and why that is, uh, is that big yeah, I think that's big enough. Um, hopefully you can read that graph. Uh, so this is just a graph of the, the uh, 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 dollar, <coughs> I guess it's technically it's the other way, it's the RMB to dollar exchange rate from 2000 until, uh, well, this one runs through 2015. Okay, I've got another one. I think I've got another one in a second to show you. Okay, so here's what you need to know about the uh, uh, Chinese exchange rate. If you go back to, well, you can see, go back to 2000, actually we could run it a little bit earlier than that, uh, their currency sold at a rate of about eight and a half to the U.S. dollar, okay? So that meant, um, but it was, it was pretty easy uh, to import goods from China. For every dollar you spent, you got 8.5 RMB worth of goods. Now, there was an argument, really the argument started around 2002, 2003, that during that time, China was fixing its exchange rate at uh, a level below the market. Okay. that they were doing that in order to advantage their imports into the U.S. market. Um, I was always suspicious of that argument even 10 years ago, uh, but maybe I was wrong. Because what happens in 2005, basically, China decides to pull off the currency peg. Okay. So prior to about 2005, you can see the flat line there, they had fixed their currency against the U.S. dollar. Around 2005, they said, okay, we're no longer going to do this strict fixing of the dollar against the RMB, and it was a little bit complicated. They said, we're going to peg against the market basket, but a lot of float, and on and on and on. The bottom line is you can see what happens from 2005 until 2008. Okay. The RMB appreciated in value. That meant that it was more expensive for Americans to import Chinese-made goods because the RMBs, you only get seven to the dollar, okay? Then what happens in 2008, we had the financial crisis and China went back to fixing their currency against the US dollar but that at that much appreciated uh, exchange rate of uh, around seven RMB to the dollar, all right? 2011, China again removed the currency peg. And what we saw, and, and I say removed, it's complicated because they, they still manipulate or still exert control in the exchange market uh, through their control of uh, massive currencies. At any rate, the peg goes off, and you can see that the RMB appreciated even more, okay, to about 6.5 to the dollar. All right. Um, I hope I put the same one if I didn't. I think yeah. Um, okay. So uh, well, again, this picture. I'm sorry. This picture got chopped off, but it's it's showing kind of the same uh, basic pattern. Uh, what's different here, as opposed to this graphic, uh, 
This shows the, uh, the actual dollar RMB exchange rate. This graphic shows what the Fed calls the real broad effective exchange rate. This adjusts the exchange rate for differences and changes in purchasing power. Okay. So what you're seeing in this graph is that, and it's an index number, so it's by itself doesn't mean much. You look at the trend. What you see is that what this graph is telling us is really since, again, not surprising, 2005 when the Fed was removed, the inflation-adjusted purchasing power of the RMB has gone up. And what that means in terms of imports, remember, is that Chinese imports have become more expensive for Americans. Okay. Now let's see if I put my last graph here. Uh, yeah, so here's the pattern of uh, imports from China. Here is uh, one more graphic, uh, and so let me explain what's going on, and you'll also learn uh, kind of how to read some of these statistics. So here is what we call uh, the trade weighted exchange rate for both the U.S. and China. The U.S. is blue, China's red. Uh, by trade weighted exchange rate, we mean not just one exchange rate, but all of the exchange rates weighted by the uh, significance of that country's uh, uh, exchange with another country. Okay, I don't know if that's making sense or not. But uh, obviously there's not just one exchange rate uh, between the, 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 the dollar RMB exchange rate, but there's also an exchange rate, the RMB to Euro exchange rate, the <coughs> RMB to Australia dollar exchange rate, RMB to Yen exchange rate, and on and on and on. So what this graphic does, what this calculation does, is, is compute not just a single exchange rate, but it's effectively an index of all exchange rates, uh, where the, the, the value of the currency exchange rate in the, in the calculation is weighted by the level of, uh, of trade, okay? Uh, here's what, why this is really significant. If you look at the China trade weighted FX rate, you see that that has been constant and declining for the past uh, really four or five years. As compared to the US exchange rate, dollar weighted exchange rate, which has been uh, uh, increasing significantly over the past four or five years. Okay. So, uh, let me make sure. No. Uh, okay. One more graphic, which I didn't include, which kind of will take you to the bottom line here, and then we'll get back to the to the main theme of the lecture. Uh, if you look and see what has been going on with the RMB just for about the past eight months, actually, it's been subtly appreciating even more. It's probably the case that if China were uh, if, if the dollar RMB exchange rate were uh, uh, completely removed, the uh, uh, market level would fall by even more than it has. So <clears throat> the idea that Mr. Trump or his or Peter Navarro uh, seems to have is that if we were to somehow get China to agree not to manipulate their currency, okay, it would, uh, yeah, good luck if you could do that. But even if you could do that, uh, what would happen is the currency would appreciate and their imports would become uh, less competitive against U.S. Uh, imports. In fact, what would probably happen if China completely eliminated uh, uh, interfering with their currency is that the currency would fall and their imports would become more competitive. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense with my hand gestures this morning, but the idea is that if the Trump Navarro policy worked, it would probably increase Chinese imports into the U.S. 
and not decrease the importance of the U.S. David, who, um, <clears throat> who are the primary in a floating exchange system? It's because we talk about China like a monolith, but I mean, it's also private banks and corporations around the world who buy and sell currency, right? And, right. and banks. So who are the main actors? Who are in, driving that currency? In that market, it's being driven mostly by, not by the private actors, uh, because obviously U.S. interest rates, U.S. Federal Reserve has an enormous impact. In this graph, you can see what our, has happened with our side of the, of the equation. Our currency strengthened in value by a lot, uh, which advantages our <coughs> purchasing of Chinese imports. And uh, uh, the, the People's Bank of China, because they control that huge mountain of dollar reserves, uh, also has, a, has an enormous impact on the exchange rate. Okay, Scott. Um, if their currency rate keeps increasing, doesn't there, wouldn't their giant stockpile of American dollars decrease in value? Yep, and, and yeah, and that's, that's a worry that they have. The, um, it was interesting in, so there was, the, the days run together, but sometime last spring, when this when there was a relatively rapid movement in the dollar RMB exchange rate, uh, the People's Bank intervened in the market, and they were spending, I've forgotten the numbers, but many, many billions of dollars a day to support the peg. And all of a sudden, people looked out there and said, well, you know, yeah, they've got $300 billion, but that could be gone almost overnight. Uh, so, you know, again, they can only manipulate for so long, All right? Um, oh, and one other thing, which this, I know I'm wondering. I know you're eager for theory, right? You want more more graphs and stuff like that. But I, the one other policy thing that you should be aware of: uh, China's motivation right now, uh, their concern right now is with internal growth and internal stability. Uh, there is uh, a lot of pressure right now. For, uh, for the wealth that has been accumulated inside China for the past uh, 15 or 20 years, a lot of people are trying to get that money out. So right now you have got, um, for example, rich Chinese guys who have made a lot of money running whatever business they run, and they're very concerned that they want to get some of their <coughs> accumulated wealth out of China. So they're doing things like coming to the U.S. and buying real estate. Uh, there's a big uh, uh, acquisition um, thing going on right now where Chinese corporations are trying to buy Western, mostly American corporations, and that's motivated in part by a desire to gain technology, but also just to get money out of the country. And what the People's Bank is doing with the currency has much more to do with controlling those uh, capital flows out of the country and trying to promote internal growth uh, than it does with currency manipulation. Okay, so, and again, if I offended your political sensibilities, I'm sorry, uh, but it's fun. The numbers are what they are. All right, um, so, now, for those eager to get back to the main lecture topic, Theory, where am I? Okay, uh, so I've talked about kind of the, the theory of exchange rate systems, uh, how exchange rate systems get set, controlled, and so on. Uh, now I want to talk uh, kind of about what's happened, how the world works. Uh, and the best way I can do this is let me just, I'm just going to give you guys a history lesson. So, here it is, you know, a brief history of the international monetary system. This is the history of the world, okay? And this is actually easier than you might think because my history lesson here breaks in pretty neatly into about four or five different epics, okay? So we've got the world before 1875, uh, the world of 1875 to 1914, the classical gold standard world, uh, the interwar period, 1915 to 44, uh, the Bretton Woods system, 45 to 72, and then the present system, which I'll call, if that's what people call it, uh, the hybrid exchange rate system. 
Okay, so let me just kind of run through each of these epics. Uh, the the bimetallism era, uh, pre-1875. I know that, that sounds like the name of a you know alternate lifestyle rock band, but it's really not. Uh, the, the, to understand the this period, um, what you have to understand, and this is actually something we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, is that most of, of the world's money prior to about 1875, and by the way, these dates are a little bit arbitrary. Uh, you know, some people would put the end of the US Civil War or, or another period, but close enough. Uh, most of the world's money supply uh, before about 1875 was, uh, uh, was commodity-backed money, and mostly it was money backed by either gold or silver, hence the term bimetallism. All right? And we, again, we talked about how that works a couple of, a week or two ago, uh, uh, a world in which money is backed by a commodity like gold is just a world in which the government promises, it's not the bank, promises to redeem a certain quantity of, uh, to give you a certain quantity of metal for a certain amount of, of currency. Is this a lot how uh, like ancient societies think? Yeah, almost all economies before whatever it was, 18 something or other, functioned on a, on a commodity money basis. Uh, and so you already know that, or now you do. Uh, the next point to make, and it's a pretty simple point to make, is what happens to exchange rates under this system, okay? So imagine that we live in a world in which the dollar to gold <coughs> ratio, that is the number of dollars you get for one ounce of gold, is equal to, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, an ounce of gold. Let's pick a number that's sort of realistic for this time period. Uh, one ounce of gold would purchase um, four ounces or, or four dollars. Okay? And now suppose you lived in a world also in which the British pound to gold exchange rate. <coughs> One British pound was worth two twos. Just make it one. Make our life easy. Okay? And now suppose I ask you, what is the exchange rate between the pound and the dollar? What does it have to be? Four dollars for a pound. It's gotta be four to one, okay? If it, takes four US dollars to buy an ounce of gold, but only one British pound to buy an ounce of gold, the British pound is four times as valuable. It's just as simple as that. The point is that before, again, about 1875, the exchange rate system was pretty much, it was just out there. It was fixed, and the dollar or pound or whatever currency, whatever other currency exchange rate was entirely determined by the commodity value of the currency. So as long as there was a gold standard in the US, and as long as there was a gold standard in Great Britain, we effectively had what amounted to a fixed exchange rate system. The only way exchange rates would ever change is if the commodity value of the currency changed. Okay? And really, as I say, that's how the world worked from time immemorial until you know, middle of the, uh, of, of the 19th, or towards the end, rather, of the 19th century. That was the period of bimetallism, okay? Now, there were some issues involved. Uh, you know, sometimes the commodity value would change. There was sometimes hoarding of metal, especially when there was, uh, 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 when your currency 
could be denominated either or valued either in terms of gold and silver. Okay. So this certainly wasn't a perfectly smoothly running system, but it was a system. Okay. So that brings us to the next standard here, the classical gold standard, 1875. Now, the thing to remember, a little bit of a history lesson here, which you probably already knew. Who was the, in fact, I'll just ask, who was the, uh, uh, the world's economic superpower at the time, both militarily and economically, I guess? Britain. This was Britain's era, right? So the Napoleonic Wars had been fought and won. Uh, Europe was kind of a mess. Uh, the U.S. was still developing. Uh, so Great Britain was the, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire kind of thing. So Great Britain pretty much had the authority to determine the rules of the international monetary system. And what they did was effectively extend, in a lot of ways, the principle of bimetallism. But they kind of refined it in two ways, uh, which might seem trivial, but I'll hope to get you to understand that they weren't. First of all, uh, the British pretty much insisted that all of their trading partners, uh, which pretty much everybody, fix the value of their currency in terms of gold. So everybody went on a single metal standard, pretty much, on a gold standard. That's not such a big change. Excuse me. The bigger change was that Great Britain insisted that gold be freely transferable between countries. Now that might seem like a you know very kind of technical inside baseball uh, uh, sort of a point, but in fact it was it was hugely important that gold be freely transferable. And let me explain to you why. Okay. Um, by making gold freely transferable, I'll write it up here. Uh, Great Britain gave rise to something called the price specie adjustment mechanism. Specie just means sort of a silly word for, for metal. Okay? So let me tell you how that would work. Let's suppose that the U.S. was importing a whole lot more from Great Britain than we were exporting to Great Britain. So let's suppose that U.S. imports from the U.K. were significantly bigger than U.S. Uh, all right, let's put it this way. UK imports from the US. Okay, and maybe numbers would help here, I don't know. Let's denominate things in terms of dollars. Let's say we were buying $100 billion worth of their stuff, and they were only buying $50 billion worth of our stuff. Okay? Now, that means, of course, we have a trade deficit. How do we pay for the difference? So, they give us $50 million worth of stock. Excuse me, they buy from us $50 million worth of stock. So, that gives us $50 million to spend for British goods. How do we pay for the rest of it? Gold. What else would we have? I heard it. We would have gold. Okay, so what would happen is that to make up for that deficit in trade, gold would flow from the US to the UK. Now it might not physically flow. Uh, you know, you could put it on a ship and sail it over to New York, but you could just transfer ownership. Okay. Now, what happens to the money supply in a country where the amount of money that they have available is fixed 
to the price of, or to the uh, uh, quantity of gold in circulation. Folks. Okay. So what is this flow of gold from the U.S. to the U.K. going to do to the money supply in the U.K.? Is it going to make it go up or down? Uh, what again? Which one? Uh, oh. Up. So the supply, the amount of money in the U.K. is going to go up. And of course, what's going to happen to the U.S. money supply? It's going to fall. What did we learn a couple weeks ago now about the relationship between prices and the amount of money in circulation? So if the money supply goes up, what would we think is going to happen to prices in the UK? They're going to go up. Remember the quantity theory, uh, which relates the amount of money in circulation to the price level. So this happens. We see the price level in Great Britain going up. And what about in the US? Prices go down. Prices would go down, or at least their rate of increase would go down. Okay. Well, just finish the circle here. If <coughs> British goods are becoming more expensive and US goods are becoming relatively less expensive, what's going to happen to this trade imbalance? Will it get bigger or littler? It's going to get smaller because think about what's happening. It's now becoming more expensive for Americans to import uh, uh, UK made goods. It's becoming less expensive for the British to import American made goods. So eventually, this trade deficit would end up getting reduced or maybe even eliminated altogether. Okay. So, as I say, this seems kind of like a little narrow technical point, and maybe it is in one sense, but it, it, the Rule number two, oops, where is it? Of the classical gold says standard, which says that gold is freely transferable between countries. Uh, rule number two means that trade deficits would eventually be eliminated simply by the flow of gold and the resulting adjustment in price levels. So another way to say the same thing is that under the classical gold standard, we had sort of an automatic stabilization mechanism at work. All right. And uh, you can argue about whether this was the best system out there, the optimal system. But in fact, this was a pretty good way to run the international monetary system. Now, there were problems. There were some serious uh, uh, financial crisis and, and economic dislocations that happened during this time. Remember I talked to you uh, last week about the uh, uh, run on the banks um, uh, in the U.S. There were similar things that happened in Europe. There was a pretty major recession that happened during this time. But on the other hand, uh, there was an awful lot of trade and development that occurred uh, during this 30-some uh, year period. Okay? All right, so anyhow, that's what happens. Now, uh, this is now one of the, yes? Um, so I, I see this example in a perfect world with no tariffs, but with tariffs, does this get all jacked it up? Gets all, it could get all jacked up, and yeah. if, we, if we were gonna do a whole semester of economic history, we'd talk about, exactly that would be one of the big questions. Did uh, other interventions, uh, uh, mess things up, mess or impede the uh, smooth adjustment process. Okay. Um, all right, so anyhow, but yeah, good, fair point. Now, oh, Scott. Quick question. In, in that example, would you say that the GMP just stayed the same? Um, that would depend on a lot of other things, including, you know, technological progress and total factor productivity would have mattered a lot. But uh, so I wouldn't want to argue about that. I wouldn't want to make claims about that. Uh, the only claim that I'd make, but it's a big one, is that the process would adjust uh, trade deficits over time. 
they would resolve trade deficits over time. Okay, so anyhow, this is the classical gold standard. Uh, so, you know, we do this, uh, you ever read those things about how ignorant millennials are? You know, I, I read every article I get. Um, uh, and one of the things that they do is they, they like give millennials history questions, like do you know when this happened? Uh, and that happened. So uh, I won't ask you if you can name the decade of the U.S. Civil War, because apparently none of you can. 1860s? Yeah, that's, that's you, you just Googled it. Uh, <laughs> but 1914, what's the big? You're smarter, not you know. <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's actually, I think there is some, whenever I read those things, I, I kind of, um, sometimes you can let facts get in the way, you know. <laughs> remembering uh, specific dates and so forth. Anyhow, 1914, why does it matter? Thank you, you're, you're now no longer millennial. Um, so World War I starts, uh, and you know, it's this huge crisis, the worst, whatever, we don't have to talk about how horrific it was. Uh, but one of the things that happens is Britain's preeminence as a superpower is it's just destroyed, right? A whole wave of a generation of British men were killed, and you know all the story. You've watched Downton Abbey. Uh, so, uh, so that happens. So, kind of skip over some of that. That brings us to this. What I'll call this the entire. I'll just label it the interwar period, and I'll call this the period from really 1914, the start of World War One all the way to the end of World War II, okay? So Britain is displaced as the world's economic power, and really in the aftermath of World War I, uh, the U.S. is the only, I mean, we're, we're the last man standing. The U.S. is in position to assume the role of economic leadership that Great Britain was no longer able to fulfill. So the US becomes the superpower at the end of World War I, and there's no way to sort of sugarcoat this in any way. The US completely screwed it up, right? <laughs> uh, the US economic leadership in the aftermath of World War I was an unmitigated disaster. So, you know, again, if we have time to do a whole semester in economic history, I could talk about it, but the U.S. kind of sort of forced us back on something like the gold standard, but then it backed off, and then it went back. Uh, the U.S. imposed uh, a bunch of really horrible tariffs, the Sweet Holly Tariff Acts, uh, uh, and so forth. It was just a mess, and you see that if you look at what happened during during the war. I think I showed you this stuff before, uh, but we saw hyperinflation in Germany, and yeah, I talked to you about this before. I gave you this graphic and the famous picture of the blocks. Um, you know, so we had hyperinflation in Germany, Hungary. Uh, we had depression in the U.S. It was just an unmitigated disaster. Okay, and it was our fault. We just didn't exert proper leadership. Now I mentioned that because of what happens at the end of World War II, okay? Uh, as horrible as U.S. economic leadership was at the end of World War I, uh, U.S. economic leadership at the end of World War II was absolutely enlightened. As bad as we behaved in 1918, we, we sort of figured it out, and, and I'm really gonna date this to this event in 1944. Uh, in 1944, the summer of 44, it was clear that the Allies were going to win the war. So even though the really another year before the fighting actually stopped, uh, the planning for the post-World War II era began uh, really in 1944, and it began at a very particular place, a uh, hotel in New Hampshire. Uh, uh, Bretton Woods, and it's apparently it's still there. I don't, I've never seen it, but it's very close to Mount Washington. You can still go there and rent a room if you want to. So in 1944, uh, all the kind of the luminaries came together in one place. Uh, I 
that's a picture of uh, John Maynard Keynes addressing the, the conference. But it was just basically all the major government officials, treasury officials, big shots from business, uh, uh, and academics like Lord Keynes uh, came together to talk about what the world was going to look like. And here's what they settled upon. The Bretton Woods system. Okay. Uh, under the Bretton Woods system, the post-World War II world, uh, in fact, I, let me back up a second. What did these guys say? What did they think about? Well, at the conference, pretty much everybody said what everybody knew, which was that U.S. leadership following World War I had been a disaster. So whatever we did following World War II was going to be different. And then they looked back, and they said, well, what kind of a system actually seems to work well. And of course, they went back to the world of, 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 of the classical gold standard. So in effect, what these people tried to do was to recreate in, for them, a modern world, what was in effect in the, the whole, the, you know, the Downton Abbey world. All right? And here's what they came up with. Okay, so they said the US dollar is obviously going to be the key international currency. And it's going to be, we're going back to the gold standard, the dollar is going to be valued at the rate of uh, $1 equals 1 35th of an ounce of gold. Okay? All other currencies in the world were going to be linked to the US dollar at that price at a fixed rate. So all the other <coughs> currencies in the world wouldn't go back to a gold standard. But what they would do is, in effect, be linked to a currency that was linked to gold. Okay? Uh, what this meant is, effectively, we had the pre-World War I, we had the classical gold standard. The only difference really was that instead of gold being the reserve asset that would flow between countries, dollars would be the reserve asset that would flow between countries. Uh, I don't know, this picture, I love this picture, because uh, I think it probably says in words what, better than what I just, or the picture, what I just said in words. So again, you see the dollar is pegged to gold, and all the other world's currencies are pegged to the US dollar, but that effectively means <coughs> that even though the reserve asset for the French and the Germans and the British would be the US dollar. The de facto, the real core reserve asset for everybody would be gold. Okay, so how did that work? Well, it worked really well. Um, here's a graphic of uh, real per capita GDP in Germany uh, from effectively, let's call it 1950, when the occupation ended, until 1972. So remember, real means adjusted for inflation, and this is per person. So what you see is, in 1950, uh, uh, Germany was effectively a third world country. Okay? They had a per capita income of about $600. Okay. I just saw that, uh, I was on a plane yesterday, and I saw, I think it was a long, long flight, so I watched that movie, Bridge of Spies. Highly recommended, really good movie. Uh, but if you watch that movie, what you see is what Germany looked like in 1960, and it was a pretty grim place. In 1950, it was a really grim place. But, by the time Bretton Woods ended in 1972, uh, uh, Germany's per capita income had effectively risen to what amounted to uh, a first world level or a developing, nearly developed country level. So in one generation, you took a country that had been in abject poverty and raised it to a developing world's lifestyle. And I could have shown you a similar graph for Japan, I could have shown you one for Great Britain, for, you know, it, it was a good deal. All right, what about the US? Well, it was also actually pretty good for the U.S. This is a different metric here. Uh, it's still um, uh, per capita GDP, but slightly different measure and so forth. But the idea that I want to show you is the trend. Uh, 1950, 
we were obviously not a poor, undeveloped country. We hadn't been bombed. Uh, but even so, during the period of Bretton Woods, uh, US GDP uh, increased significantly. So the Bretton Woods system was good for everybody. All right, so how come it didn't last? Well, this is a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Uh, what we had in the early 1970s in the US was uh, uh, really quite, for us at the time, significant inflation. Nothing, of course, like uh, German or Hungarian hyperinflation, but still, we were seeing inflation rates of seven, eight percent. That was quite high for the US. Uh, experience and why we were getting those inflation rates is, is, a, is a topic for a different day, but we had really high inflation rates. Now, as we already said, if your currency, if, if there's increases in prices in your country, then there's downward pressure being put on the currency. So what happens in the early 1970s is that there's tremendous pressure on the U.S. dollar to devalue. Okay? Finally, the uh, fixed exchange rate system breaks. In 1971, there was something called this, but this is history, I don't, I'm gonna flash through this quickly, I don't expect you to remember the details. Uh, the US dollar was devalued uh, <coughs> one thirty-fifth of an ounce to uh, one thirty-eighth of an ounce. Uh, didn't really work in 73, the dollar came under more heavy pressure. Uh, Japanese currencies are allowed to float. We had the Jamaica Agreement in 1936, which basically put a stake in the heart of Bretton Woods. The clear that uh, exchange rates, flexible exchange rates, are now acceptable. Okay. So, um, uh, as I say, I'm going to say that Bretton Woods collapsed in 1971, but really it was a uh, didn't completely collapse until '76. Who cares? What matters today is that we no longer have Bretton Woods. Yes, oh, so when because of the gold figure? Oh, okay. yeah, that may have, I didn't ever think about that. And I'm not going to ever think about it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so there you go. Um, all right, so the question is, like, what, what do we have today? And what we have today is, is, is what I'm, well, because it is, uh, this hybrid system, okay? Uh, and by hybrid system, I mean that different countries have different exchange rate policies, okay? So uh, the best way I can help you understand what the range of, of possibilities are here, uh, I'll go by the IMF, but the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and by the way, IMF is a great source of data and research. If you want to know something about a particular country's economy, uh, just Google up International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, either one, and, uh, and you'll learn a lot of good stuff. At any rate, what the IMF does is every country in the world that ha gets classified uh, into one of, I can never remember whether it's eight or nine uh, uh, buckets of exchange rate systems. So let me explain to you a little bit about what those are. All right, so first of all, we have countries which have no national currency at all, okay? Uh, so we've got these kind of little interesting examples uh, in Panama, the US dollar is their currency. Uh, in Ecuador, the US dollar is their currency. Although apparently in Ecuador, they're, they're thinking about experiencing with, experimenting with something like a Bitcoin. We'll see how that works out for them. But in these countries, uh, they don't have a national currency. And in fact, those seem like little interesting but not very important examples. The really big example of a world where there are no national currencies is in the Eurozone. Uh, if you think about it, Italy doesn't have a currency. They use the currency that's provided to them by the uh, European Monetary Union. David? You brought up Bitcoin. I see that disrupting exchange rates. Yeah, uh, it could be. And that's, that's the promise. But then there, it turns out there's also issues with Bitcoins. Like they're subject to uh, uh, all kinds of fraud, impersonation, drug dealers like them. 
Uh, so you know, it's, um, we'll see, but that could disrupt this whole this whole system. Okay, so you have countries with no national currencies. There, are, so I, I I'm giving these to you on kind of the continuum of the way that IMF uh, thinks about these things. Uh, the next step on the ladder, and this is a word that you phrase or thing you may not have heard of before. Uh, there are countries which have a quote currency board. What is meant uh, when a country is described as having a currency board is a country in which the exchange rate is fixed by some uh, impartial, non-politicized institution within the country. Uh, the, the clearest example of this is in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is in a really important financial center, so don't think about it as just this little city-state with seven million people or eight, whatever it's got. Uh, uh, Hong Kong is a hugely important financial center, so it matters. Hong Kong has a currency board arrangement, and that means that the Hong Kong dollar trades 7.75 to the US dollar period, end of discussion. It is a fixed exchange rate. All right. Then you go down the IMF list, um, you've got other countries which have some version of what they call a fixed exchange rate system. Okay, and the only real difference here uh, is that they don't peg, or may not, sometimes they do, but they may not explicitly peg their <coughs> currency at a precise level against one other single currency. So for example, uh, I use China as the example. During some of those periods between 2005 and 2008, uh, and also I guess post 2008, uh, China fixed, or no, I'm sorry, that would be 2011. Uh, China fixed their currency against a basket of other currencies. So that, um, that meant that if there were variations within that bundle of currencies, uh, you might see, or there could be variations within that bundle of currencies, but that market basket of currencies would always trade at a fixed rate against the RMB. Okay? So you could always buy, you know, 0 0.025 US dollars, whatever that number, be bigger than that, uh, you know, five Japanese yen and 0.7 Australian dollars for one RMB, even though the uh, their exchange rates would change. All right, going down the uh, IMF list, uh, we have some other countries which have what's called a crawling peg. And a crawling peg system is a system in which a country's exchange rate against, and again, it's almost always crawling against the US dollar, would adjust, but only adjust at periodic uh, intervals and it would adjust in response to specific macroeconomic conditions. So for example, the Costa Rican currency, and I always get this one wrong, don't they have a Colon? Who's, somebody's, who's been to Costa Rica? All right, and do you remember? I, it's not a peso, I can't remember what they called you said. A Colon? Yeah. Uh, their currency is fixed against the US dollar but it changes periodically in response to relative inflation rates, usually, and then maybe interest rate factors as well. All right, then you've got countries which allow their currency to crawl, or excuse me, allow their currency to float, but within a band that usually moves. So some countries will say, uh, you know, our exchange rate is three to one against the US dollar, plus or minus 5% or 8%, whatever. You've then got countries which allow their currency to float, but reserve the right to manipulate their exchange rates. And then finally, you've got countries that simply allow their currency to float, that make no explicit intervention into the currency markets. Now, you've got these, whatever there are, eight or nine different uh, currency regimes, by far the most common currency regime in the post Bretton Wood era is the independent flow. Currencies are allowed to float uh, under, you know, post Bretton Woods era. All right, um, let me just kind of power through this last uh, bit of material here. So 
the question is, how well has this how well has this worked? In the post Bretton Woods era, where we've got different countries following different policies, have things worked better or worse than they would have worked in a Bretton Woods era or a classical world standard era? All right, and the answer is, and now again I'm wandering into offering my opinion, and I should be careful here, but. I got nothing but to try and do this. Uh, my assessment is in this post Bretton Woods era, I say mine, like a lot of people, the consensus assessment would be that the post Bretton Woods era has in one sense worked very well. And the sense in which it's worked very well is that we've seen remarkable economic development in the less developed world. And I think back to, I guess, week one where I showed you some numbers on how much progress has been made in China, how much progress has been made in India. Okay. So we've seen huge parts of the world being elevated from abject poverty into something like a, a, a first world or near a first world lifestyle. So that's been a remarkable achievement of the post Bretton Woods era. The other side of the coin, though, is that in the post Bretton Woods era, we've seen a series of financial crises that have been provoked by or because we have this flexible uh, exchange rate system. So the, it's, the good news, bad news is lots of economic development in the post Bretton Woods era. The bad news is lots of crises. And this is what I think everybody should be aware of, is at least the possibility. So let me finish the history lesson here by talking about some of the major crises that have occurred. Uh, the first one that I, I should talk about is the Mexican peso crisis. Right? So you guys may actually, you were young then, but you might remember some of this. Um, so in the, before 1994, uh, the Mexican peso was pegged against the US dollar. They had a fixed exchange rate system, and things were going pretty well in Mexico. There was a lot of outside investment that was flowing into Mexico. Um, Mexico was you know, really making progress economically, but there was also really high inflation in, uh, in Mexico during this time period. That was putting downward pressure on the dollar peso exchange rate. So on December 20th, 1994, the Mexican government announced that they were going to devalue the peso by 14%. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you suppose the December 20th is an interesting number to give you, or date to give you here? Well, isn't that usually when the winter solstice is? Yeah, so it's the shortest day of the year. Uh, what, what else is happening around December 20th? Christmas. Christmas, right? People are drinking and going to office parties and doing, you know, really truly embarrassing things, and they're shopping, right? So why do you suppose Mexico announced this devaluation on December twentieth? They what? Yeah, they were hoping. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be like hungover and trying to explain things to your wife. Okay, <laughs> you wouldn't notice this devaluation. Okay. So they were hoping to kind of sneak this one under the radar. That was really stupid to hope that. Imagine you were, let's just put you in the role of some rich Mexican. You made a lot of money. You had a couple, you know, 10, 15, 20 million pesos <coughs> piled up in, a, in an account somewhere in Mexico. And you thought the dollar peso exchange rate was gonna change specifically that the that the peso was going to lose value, what would you try and do? Turn to dollars. You try and convert to dollars as quickly as you could. And that's exactly what happens. So they announced a 14% devaluation. Uh, everybody basically ran for the exits. Everybody tried to change their currency. Okay. And in fact, what happened almost overnight is that the peso fell by almost 40% in value. There was a big run on the peso, that was bad. Uh, 
uh, with Mexico's dollar reserves pretty much vanished overnight. Uh, the U.S. had to organize, and the International Monetary Fund had to organize an emergency bailout. Uh, it was it was not good. All right, so. In the grand scheme of things, the Mexican peso crisis wasn't a very big deal. Mexico is a relatively small country. It didn't have big implications for the rest of the world's economy. But what the Mexican peso crisis showed us, and this is where I want to give you guys a history lesson, what the peso crisis showed us is that in this modern world, capital can move really, really quickly. And if it moves really quickly, things can fall apart almost literally overnight, which is what happened in Mexico. So even though the Mexican crisis in the grand scheme of things wasn't a big deal, it didn't start an international recession or anything like that, what Mexico showed us is that in this post Bretton Woods world, stuff can happen really quickly and really catastrophically. And you see the same story in these next two crises I'll talk to you about, uh, the Asian currency crisis, okay? So, again, if this is, I, I could almost just get the word Mexico, uh, take the word Mexico out of the previous slides and call it Asia, and this is what happens. So, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, several Asian countries, and I, now it's important, China is not in this, China's the other Asian country. The Asian crisis involved the, you know, Korea, uh, uh, Thailand, um, you know, places like that, uh, the, the, the tiger countries, Vietnam. Uh, most of these countries had fixed their currency against the U.S. dollar. Uh, and then, uh, well, I'll just tell you, uh, there was an explosion of credit in several of these countries. So a lot of capital was flowing into these Asian countries. If you had gone to Bangkok, in 1992 or 1993, you would have just seen construction cranes everywhere. Uh, 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 Jakarta, uh, uh, same thing, over and over and over, Seoul, same problem, not problem. Uh, lots and lots of expansion, big kind of bubble bursting, okay? So, you play the clock forward a little bit, middle of 1997, uh, in Thailand, again, it's just a Mexican story. Uh, high rates of inflation, there was a lot of pressure on the Thai bot. Uh, the Central Bank of Thailand announced that they were going to defend the bot, but no one believed that they could do that, and they were right. Uh, so the Thai bot collapsed by, again, 40% seems to be the magic number. Uh, now, what happened in Asia was far more serious than what happened in uh, um, Mexico. The Asian financial crisis led to a lot of firms be, uh, going bankrupt. Okay. Uh, one other thing that was true about the Asian crisis, and this might seem a little inside baseball, but it's, it's important for you all to understand when you think about international trade and investment. Uh, a lot of these Asian, a lot of the Asian debt was either multi-currency or dollar denominated. And what that meant is that the, the debtor had agreed to pay back either the entire thing or to make principal repayments in US dollars and not their local currency. So if you think about you're a, a, a Thai manufacturing company and you've got $10 million worth of bonds outstanding, you're obligated to make principal repayments in terms of dollars, and all of a sudden the dollars have become 40% more expensive, you're quite likely to be uh, really stressed and maybe even bankrupt as a consequence of that. So, small message, take the international finance class, we'll talk more about it. Uh, Multi-currency bonds can be tricky. All right, so anyhow, it was a widespread recession. Uh, now, I, at this point, I could talk about other ones. I'll just mention Argentina really quickly, the peso crisis. Um, the Argentinian government uh, in 1991 basically linked to the peso, the Argentinian peso at parity, meaning one peso equals one dollar. Uh, that really worked well. Uh, however, and this is another problem that we get in this multi-currency world. So this is. Let me slow down just a half a second to explain to you another problem. 
So think about Argentina and when they pegged the peso to the dollar, all right? The Argentinian peso is pegged to the dollar, but there's other currencies out there which are floating. In particular, uh, the Brazilian real was floating against all the world's other currencies. Okay? So the real uh, depreciates in value in the later 1990s. Right? What that meant is that Brazilian export products were much more competitive on international markets than were Argentinian export products. And the two countries export a lot of the same things, right? Agricultural commodities, basically, all right? So what happens is the real is falling, the dollar is rising, which means that the peso is rising. All of a sudden, Argentina is having a really, really hard time exporting their commodities. They're having a hard time being competitive in those export markets. So that was a problem. Finally, in 2002, after seeing monthly uh, inflation rates close to 20%, uh, Argentina finally abandons the peg. They allow the peso to float. And again, we see the same, the same story over and over again, right? There's this run to the exits. And uh, in the case of Argentina, they actually defaulted on their bonds and have been uh, cut out of international capital markets ever since. So, so that's what happened. All right, so again, sorry I, I dragged you on after break a little bit, but I wanted to get through this material. The assessment of the post Bretton Woods era is good news, lots of economic growth and real progress in places where people desperately needed to make progress. Bad news, a lot of instability. Okay? All right, go get coffee and come back. I've got one more 